Welcome back to Philosophy for the People. We are joined once again by Dr. Thomas Bogardis, who is one of my favorite philosophical generalists. He researches many different subjects. He's published on many different subjects in many different areas, philosophy of mind, epistemology, metaphysics, right? I guess your naturalistic paper is, a, is something in metaphysics, right? And, right? I think and, that counts, uh, yeah, that counts. Yeah, it counts, right? And um, current gender theory and gender debates. So the problem whenever I talk with you, Thomas, is not like a lack of something to talk about, but so much I want to talk about. I don't, I don't even know where, <laughs> I don't know where to begin. I, we're going, I guess we'll begin on, um, on this recent project that you're working on of whether sex is complicated. Don't get too excited, people. We're not talking about the romantic aspect here. Uh, we're, we're going to go into the, the, the jungle of gender theory, which, uh, we've had previous conversations on. And I will just mention that if people haven't heard those previous conversations, it might behoove them to take a listen to those first before we move a little bit further into this conversation and then time permitting, and we'll see where we go. Maybe we could revisit some themes we've discussed before in epistemology and philosophy, religion, and stuff like that. Either way, welcome back to the show, Dr. Bogardis. How are you? And what have you been up to? Um, Oh man, there's a lot of questions. Hey, thanks for having me back. It's nice to see you again, Pat. Um, I'm doing all right. Uh, a little busy today. Um, and you, did you ask what I'm working on? Or what? Yeah, what have you been up to? You know, you still you still rolling on the mats, doing jujitsu, all that good stuff too. Yeah, yeah, I did take a break for like a month um, after a little bit of a concussion and a car accident. Um, yeah. But I have started doing jujitsu again, um, trying to take it a little easy. Um, but yeah, I just, just went on Sunday and I have a little bit of a mark on my forehead. I don't know if you can see it, but no, uh, I can't, but the beard's looking strong. Okay. Yeah. My wife was a little bummed because, uh, somebody's shin bone kind of collided with my forehead. And oh. so I had a little bit of a bruise for a while, but, um, it's, it's okay now. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I've been working on a lot kind of more than normal. I mean, Typically, I just do like one paper at a time. That's kind of been my MO. Mm -hmm. Just like focus on one project and then finish it and then move on to the next one. But for some reason, I don't know, last few months, I've had like four things going. I've written written a response to some uh, recent objections to a theory of knowledge that uh, I and a co-author had published um, back in 2020. Mm -hmm. I think like four, no, three people have published responses and offered counterexamples. So, um, we responded to that and I, I just sent that off and then um, working on an, another quick response to a gender paper um, with a co-author. So that's also in the works. And then um, I have this paper that maybe we'll talk about today about whether um, words like male and female are ambiguous when applied to organisms. And I submitted that at the end of December and then Okay, just just two more things. <laughs> Keep going. This is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was invited to participate in a symposium for a journal uh, responding to a, a recent book by a philosopher, John Pittard at um, Yale Divinity School uh, about religious disagreement. So that's something I hadn't really thought about for many years. Mm -hmm. um, so I've gotten to dust off that part of my brain and think about disagreement stuff again. So I'm like 75% done with that paper and it's due next week. So wow. um, I'm going to try to finish that one up. And then I guess um, the next thing on the horizon is um, I think I'm going to try to write a paper with a student who is interested in the topic of this argument against um, Christianity from um, meager moral fruits. It's called the argument from meager moral fruits. Right. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, if Christianity so is true. Why wouldn't we see moral fruit from Christians, essentially? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, especially because Christianity kind of promises that it promises mm -hmm. that if you become a Christian, um, you'll receive a sort of treatment, um, a benefit. You'll receive this gift of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> that will manifest itself in various ways. And there are all these gifts of the Spirit, these fruits of the Spirit. Um, and so shouldn't we be able, be able to do something like a clinical trial and see if yeah. there's an effect of this treatment? Um, and I guess a lot of atheists say, if we were to do such a study, nobody has, but if we were to do it, you wouldn't see a treatment effect. Um, and then I, I think that would be a serious problem for Christianity if that were true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are the sorts of things I'm thinking about these days. 
Well, it would be great once that uh, paper is further along to have you and or that student on to discuss it, because I'm sure that topic would be of interest uh, yeah. to the audience. So but for now, we'll stay we'll stay focused. I'm not going to chase too many squirrels. Uh, yeah. And we did want to discuss some of your latest research and uh, writing concerning gender debates. So focus us in here, Dr. Bogardus. What is this latest paper of yours? Uh, what problem are you trying to solve now? And then maybe we can get into some of the details. All right. So I started thinking about philosophy of gender stuff, I guess, back around 2016 or 2017 or so. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess uh, time flies by. And now that's, I guess that's been a while, but it doesn't feel very long. Um, and so I still feel like I'm you know, learning new things and ex exploring this area. Um, I still feel like a tourist for sure. sure. But something I've noticed in this area, um, I've noticed a certain trend or a kind of popular view among um, people working in this area. Mm -hmm. it, they, it seems like they think that um, words like male and female are uh, ambiguous, have, mm -hmm. have more than one meaning. And I think um, clearly they do. Um, so when we're talking about males and females, um, we're talking about the biological sexes. And um, of course, the word sex itself is ambiguous in many ways, as you pointed out when we opened the show. Um, but it can be used to refer to the biological sexes, um, can be used to refer to males and females. But those words, male and female, we do use them um, sometimes as nouns, sometimes as adjectives. Sometimes we use them to describe things like pipe fittings. <laughs> um, so clearly there are there are different senses of these words, male and female. Sure. But I think even if we focus in on like describing organisms, so using it as an adjective to describe organisms um, as male or female, uh, I think a lot of um, people working in this area think there's still an ambiguity. They think there's still different senses of these words. And um, the way this... The way your listeners or viewers might have encountered this is a lot of people use this kind of thought um, when they're arguing that sex is not binary. Right. So a lot of people will tell you sex is not binary. And often, if you ask them why they think so, they'll say, well, you know, the word sex or words like male and female used to describe organisms can pick out many different things, can pick out many different features. Maybe you're talking about hormone levels. Or maybe you're talking about um, certain arrangements of chromosomes. Mm. Or maybe you're talking about um, certain kinds of um, uh, reproductive organ organs or something like that. Um, and the list goes on. Maybe I mean, there's there's people working in the sciences will use phrases like brain sex. They'll, they'll mm -hmm. say there's such a thing as brain sex. They're like male brains and female brains. And so the idea seems to be like there's no one sense of the word male even speaking of organisms, maybe you mean hormonally male, maybe you mean chromosomally male, maybe you mean brain male, or something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. brainly male. Um, and for many of these, maybe all of them, um, the sort of feature that you're picking out isn't binary. So like when you think about hormone levels, there, there aren't just two options for hormone levels. There's There are whole ranges of hormone levels that an organism might have. Sure. Yeah, and similarly, even with um, chromosome structure, I mean, even among humans, uh, most humans are either, with regard to their sex chromosomes, either XX or XY, but there are other, um, there are variations. There are right. other sorts of chromosome structures that humans can have. And if you look at other organisms, it's more complicated still. There's There are far more ways that other organisms uh, determine sex, um, even those organisms that do it genetically. Mm -hmm. um, there are other kinds of sex chromosomes. And some organisms don't determine sex. Um, the sex of an organism is, is not caused by genetics at all. It's caused by the environment. Mm -hmm. um, with crocodiles, it has to do with the temperature at which the eggs were incubated. So mm -hmm. crocodiles, I'm told, um, I'm pretty sure this is true, don't have sex chromosomes at all. Um, every crocodile kind of has all the genetic information required to either become fe female or male. Wow, and, that's actually what, pretty cool. Yeah, and what sets them down the path is the temperature of incubation of the egg. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for some organisms, sex is determined by not chromosomes at all, but by um, environment. So anyway, all that to say, like, um, if there are these different senses of the word male and female, and a lot of them don't refer to features or quantities that are binary, 
then people conclude, oh, look, sex isn't binary. In fact, sex is really, really complicated. <laughs> They'll say sex mm -hmm. is complex um, because it could mean the word sex, words like male and female have many meanings. And a lot of those meanings refer to features that are very complicated. Um, and so, wow, isn't sex really complicated? Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you say like sex is binary or sex is simple, you'll be kind of derided as uh, simple-minded or naive neanderthal yeah yeah so. another way that this shows up is um some people think that um because sex the word sex is ambiguous in this way mm -hmm. because the word male and the word female are ambiguous in this way um one sense of the word male doesn't have to do with hormones or chromosomes or reproductive organs organs or um the kind of gametes you're producing Rather, it just has to do with your so-called gender identity, mm -hmm. um, your, the psychological state that you have of um, taking yourself to be uh, male or female. Um, whatever gender identity is, um, a lot of people think that that would just be another sense of the word male. So that mm -hmm. if you have a male gender identity, you are male mm -hmm. in one sense of male. If you have a female gender identity, then you are female in a uh, one perfectly good sense of female. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, and then some people use that kind of reasoning to reach the conclusion that you can be male um, in a way that doesn't depend on biology at all. Mm -hmm. So even if you are you have XX chromosomes and you're producing ova um, and you have high levels of estrogen, low levels of testosterone and so on, um, you can still count as male uh, if you have a male gender identity. Right. Okay. Um, so I think those are maybe the two ways that your viewers might have encountered this sort of ambiguity hypothesis mm -hmm. on, on Twitter or in conversations about this sort of thing. Yeah, no, that's that sounds exactly right. That I'm sure that a lot of the listeners are going to be familiar with those situations, almost certainly on Twitter, which we know you like to be on. Uh, <laughs> you know, Twitter isn't, it isn't always awful. You know, there, there are some genuinely, uh, productive, uh, yeah. things that, that happen on, on Twitter. So, uh, yeah. I mean, and I'm on, I've, yeah, right. I've, I've made connections and, you know, made some friends via Twitter that I wouldn't have made otherwise, um, mm -hmm. had some opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So, yeah, I mean, it's a tool and it can be used well or poorly. Um, so that's all. That's all we need to say about Twitter. I think that's all we need to say <laughs> about that. So, all right, so, all right. Swinging back now, yeah. To so the in top, this, in this, yeah, in this paper, now. what I try to do is, um, well, first I try to trace back the origins of this idea. Like, how long have people been saying stuff like this? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I may have found the origin of it. Um, I mean, I don't claim that I'm the first one to have found this or anything, but at least sure. for my own purposes, I think I found it. <laughs> and I think Great. it had to do with um, a paper written by um, John Money. Mm -hmm. And um, Joan, and I think Hampson, but I'm, I'm blanking on, hold on. I'll give you the name of the other guy. It was a married couple. Yeah, it's John and Joan Hampson. Yeah. Okay, so John Money, John, John Hampson. Money, Joan Hampson, Joan Hampson, and John Hampson. Mm -hmm. So they wrote a paper back in 1955, um, an examination of some basic sexual concepts, the evidence of human hermaph hermaphroditism. Hermaphroditism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a word. <laughs> that's a word. Yeah. That's a word. It's a word you never think you'll have to say aloud when you're reading. Yeah. <laughs> when I start coming on the page, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I don't want to say hermaphrodite, but hermaphroditism. Right. Uh -huh. um, anyway, we're past it now. Um, <laughs> and in this paper, um, the authors distinguish between, I think it's six, six um, categories of sex, they say, mm -hmm. six variables of sex. Um, they talk about external genital morphology, internal reproductive structures, hormonal sex, um, secondary sexual characteristics, gonadal sex, chromosome, mm -hmm. chromosomal sex. Um, yeah. And then they also talk about gender role as male or female, um, how you were raised or what sort of role you're playing in society. So anyway, they speak of these as variables of sex. Um, other authors have called them types of sex. Um, layers of sex, kinds mm -hmm. of sex. Um, others like Harry Benjamin and Anne Fausto Sterling use this talk of like kinds of sex, layers mm -hmm. of sex, types of sex. 
Um, and sometimes they'll just flat out say these are different senses of the word sex. Um, so I try to collect some quotations where people really do give voice to this view that there there is a kind of linguistic ambiguity going on here. Sure. Um, so I try to prove the case that this really is a view um, and it's got a historical pedigree. Yep. Not like attacking a straw man. Here. You haven't this just created this giant straw man. Behold. Yeah. <laughs> now watch me destroy yeah. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I have some recent examples. One is from a forthcoming paper from a philosopher um, named Rebecca Mason. And it's forthcoming mm -hmm. in Australasian Journal of Philosophy. And she says there are various acceptable ways of defining the property of being female. And then she goes on to, con she's attacking the view that to be a woman is just to be an adult human female. And what she does in the paper is um, she considers different senses of the word female. And she's really clear that like these are different things that the word female might mean. And so she considers an alleged chromosomal sense, an alleged gametic sense, an alleged phenotypic sense. So your, phen your phenotype is the way you're um, presenting, the way your body's actually formed, mm -hmm. um, the way you're genes are actually expressed and appear. Um, so the sort of anatomy and physiology that we associate with males and females, she thinks that's yeah. another sense of the word female. Mm. Um, okay, so there's a, a very recent example of somebody who seems to endorse this ambiguity hypothesis. And then very recently, um, another philosopher, Marcus, um, I'm pretty sure you say his last name, Arvin. Marcus Arvin, A-R-V-A-N, has a paper forthcoming um, where he says, on ordinary usage, the literal meaning of female is ambiguous, having both a biological interpretation and also a gendered interpretation, referring to individuals who satisfy socially constructed gender norms, um, such as norms for gendered traits and performance, as well as self-identification. Okay, so um, although he doesn't give us the usual list of like chromosomal male, hormonal male, comedic male, et cetera. He does say that female is ambiguous between a kind of gender role sense, as John mm -hmm. Money would have said, and a biological sense. Okay, so I think people do actually endorse this ambiguity yeah. hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then step two in the paper is um, I try to present some evidence against it. Um, so the ambiguity hypothesis is that the words male and female used as adjectives to describe organisms mm -hmm. are ambiguous, have right. more than one sense. Mm -hmm. So um, to say that the word's ambiguous, just, is just to me, a rough, rough explanation is it has more than one meaning. And when you look up a word in the dictionary, if it has more than one entry, um, sometimes those will be marked with like one and two and so on, mm -hmm. then the word's ambiguous. So some examples are like the word um, uh, bank in English um, can refer to like a river bank or a financial institution. The word mouse in English can refer to the animal or this thing that we use with our computers. Right. Um, there are lots of examples of um, ambiguity in English where the same word can have more than one sense. Uh, I guess footnote, the word bank might not actually be a good example because those two words have different etymologies, different origins. So they might be two words with two senses. But sure. a genuine, genuine ambiguity would be one word um, with more than one sense. And there are lots mm -hmm. of examples of that. Okay, and so um, good news is uh, philosophers of language and linguists um, have a pretty firm grasp, not totally firm, but a pretty firm grasp. They're pretty familiar with this idea of ambiguity, and they've um, generated some tests that you can run for ambiguity. How handy. Yeah, I know. That's nice. Um, and since this is just a linguistic phenomenon, um, we can do this all from our armchair, which is nice. Uh, I mean, ideally, we'd actually, we do some surveys and actually poll people. Um, but just as a matter of fact, that's typically not the way these tests are run. You just sort of run the test in your own case and say, oh, yeah, that sounds like the word passes or fails. You publish it. You put it forward for other people to consider. Yep. And then, you know, the, the reader might agree or disagree. So mm -hmm. that's the limitation of this kind of test. Um, we are just asking readers, I'm asking readers to exercise their linguistic competence and judge for themselves whether words like male and female are passing or failing these ambiguity tests. Yeah, I like that. You've empowered the listener. That's what we'd like to do here. Yeah, like well, I'm remarkable. saying all this because I presented this in person and then people gave me, uh, yeah, so, I mean, since this is a contentious issue, I think people's um, hackles were up and they're, they're interested in finding a problem. And so I, 
so they gave me a really hard time. Some people in the Q and A gave me a pretty hard time for not having actually like done a survey or something. Oh yeah, <laughs> sure yeah. And yeah. I guess yeah, <laughs> it, 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 right. yeah, it would be nice since I am claiming something about you know ordinary language. I guess we should check with the users of the language. But just as a matter of fact, like when people do this sort of philosophy of language, they tend not to, yeah, um, supplement it with any kind of experimental philosophy we're actually doing a survey you just present it and you know if readers find it plausible then they'll agree and if not then they don't you know same thing with um in other areas of philosophy when like gettier wrote um his famous refutation of the view that knowledge is justified true belief mm -hmm. we didn't get any kind of like survey results or poll results right. we just said like you know clearly we've got a justified true belief but it isn't knowledge right mm -hmm. right reader right <laughs> and then it's kind of up to the reader to decide. So anyway, um, that's why I put that little preface before these tests. I, I understand that I guess it would be pretty cool um, to have survey results and actually do some experimental philosophy, but um, I don't think that's strictly speaking required. I'm just going to yeah. present these tests for your consideration. And if you find them plausible, cool. Yeah. And if not, of, then forget about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. A lot of surveys I read on a lot of things are a little sketchy too sometimes. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. And you know, I'm not really trained at like um, survey construction or execution or how to interpret or present the results. So I wouldn't be the person to do that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I have um, some degree of a grasp on these tests. And so here's how they would go here. Yeah, let's tests. let's get into the tests. Let's here do are some it. tests okay. that you can run. Mm -hmm. A really simple one, um, and it's not one that I would like hang my head on, so to speak. Um, I wouldn't rely on this one. Is just what's called a contradiction test. So um, I'll give you an example of this test of contradiction. So if you consider this sentence, I saw her duck. I saw her duck. Um, you recognize that there's some ambiguity here owing to uh, the phrase her duck. Are we talking about a waterfowl? Like I saw her waterfowl, she owns a duck and I saw her duck. Or are we using duck as a verb? And that's what I saw her do. I saw her duck. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that there's some ambiguity in there. And one way um, that you can bring that out is um, by formulating a sentence uh, like this. And then ask yourself, can I get a true reading of this sentence? The mm -hmm. sentence is, I saw her duck, but I didn't see her duck. Mm -hmm. I saw her duck, but I didn't see her duck. And I'm trying not to like bias the results with my tone or uh, inflection or anything like that. Um, but I think you can get a true reading of that. I saw her duck. Maybe I saw her waterfowl. She showed me her pet duck. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see her duck. I mean, she didn't actually bob and weave or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if that word, if that phrase actually her duck were not ambiguous, if it were univocal, mm -hmm. if it just had one interpretation, then that sentence would have been a contradiction. Yeah. It, right. I saw her duck, but I didn't see her duck. That would have been a contradiction. And yep. so it would have struck us as like impossible. Like mm -hmm. that couldn't be true. Mm -hmm. But our brains kind of search for a true reading and find one. And mm -hmm. we, we realize, oh, here's how I can make sense of that idea. Yeah. I saw her waterfowl, but I didn't see her bob and weave. Right. Okay. Um, so that's one test for ambiguity. We do, we construct one of these sentences that if the word or phrase were univocal would result in a contradiction. Um, but if it's ambiguous, there would be a true reading of it. And then just ask ourselves, is this a contradiction or is there a true reading of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can do something like that with words like male and female used to describe organisms. If you just take like a typical male, like Joe Biden, um, and just consider the sentence that Joe is male. Um, the, the ambiguity hypothesis says, this is kind of underspecified. What kind of male are we talking about here? You know, are you describing his hormone levels? Are you describing his chromosome, his chromosomal structure? Are you describing his anatomy, his gender identity, his gender role? Um, so according to the ambiguity hypothesis, there are lots of readings of a sentence like Joe is male. Mm -hmm. According to the hypothesis that this word is actually univocal when used to describe organisms, um, there's only one reading. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, I don't want to like hide the ball here or bury the lead. I think the true reading is um, to be male is to um, have a certain kind of function right. or possibly disposition. I'm not sure exactly the best way to state it, but it's either a function or a disposition. I kind of like the function one. Yes. Yeah, so um, I... It's to have a certain kind of biological function and it's to have the function of producing sperm. Yeah. 
Um, of course, things may not always fulfill their functions. Uh, mm -hmm. Like a broken toaster has the function of producing bread, but it doesn't. My car has the function of starting, but if the battery is dead, it won't. Right. Um, certain cell receptors in our bodies have a function of binding certain things, but if they're truncated or mutated or broken, they don't. Yep. Okay, you get it. So, um, so and I just mentioned that because some people quickly think like, what about people who don't produce sperm? Or yeah, that's one a very common objection, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to understand where this is function talk that we're right. That and... Functions can fail. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So um, I think that's what it is to um, be a male or to be a female, to have a certain kind of function, your body, to have a body with a certain kind of function, mm -hmm. um, either to produce sperm or to produce eggs. Okay. So um, I think that's what talk of male and female, that's the feature that these words are tracking. That's what come to find out. That's what the biologists have been tracking this whole time. Mm -hmm. Early in the history of science, we had crude and mistaken understandings of what makes someone male or female. Um, but we were talking about this property. We just didn't know what it was. Um, come to find out through investigation. Oh, it's the function of producing sperm in the case of being male. Yeah. Producing eggs in the case of being female. Okay. So those are the two competing interpretations of a sentence like Joe is male. And then we can run this um, ambiguity test mm -hmm. by constructing a sentence like Joe is male and Joe is not male. Mm -hmm. Joe is male and Joe is not male. Okay. And then you just, again, you just lean back, exercise your linguistic competence and ask yourself, <laughs> is that a contradiction? Um, or can I get a true reading of it uh, using these words in their, in their, in their ordinary ways? And again, if it's if the ambiguity hypothesis is true, there is a there is a true reading of this sentence. Um, maybe we're saying something like Joe has hormone levels typical of males, but anatomy typical of females or something mm. like that. Um, but on the hypothesis that this word is univocal, this this is just a contradiction. Right. And uh, I'll just report that when I run the test, if I were a participant in a survey like this, I would answer a contradiction. Yeah, let me see. Let me run it. I got the same result. Okay. Yeah. Um, but again, um, I recognize that um, these tests have their limits, especially among philosophers who are really skilled at like finding possibilities where other people would just find impossible. Philosophers right? do have that skill, don't they? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we try to think outside the box and find, mm -hmm. you know, kind of unusual interpretations of sentences. Okay, whatever. So I, again, I don't think this test is conclusive. Here's another one. Um, it's just a redundancy test. It's like the contradiction test. Mm -hmm. um, but with the duck example, you can say something like, I saw her duck. What's more, I saw her duck. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And um, if this were univocal, then this when, then what I just did was redundant. That sentence was redundant. Yeah. Um, but because there's ambiguity, I may be giving you additional information here. I saw yeah. her duck, waterfowl. Mm -hmm. But what's more, I saw her duck. Um, okay. So that's just, it's, but it's a lot like the test of contradiction. It's just sort mm -hmm. of the inverse. So you can do something like that with um, being male or being female. You can construct sentences like Joe is male. Furthermore, Joe is male. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I'm trying not to bias you with the tone or my, my voice, but to me, that just sounds redundant. Um, but I guess to be fair, I should try to do it with a straight face. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I do. Like, like I, I, I really appreciate you, Dr. Bogardis, because one of the, the first times I think you did a conversation on this, I think you kind of got attacked because people, I guess, thought you were advocating for the position you're actually arguing against. Because your tone was so neutral. <laughs> now, look, I try to do that too. You know, look, we know where we stand on this. Listeners know that we're both quite skeptical. You're published as being skeptical against a, a lot of gender theory. I've made my thoughts known, but we're, of course, going to try and be fair and look at all the arguments. At the same time, though, there is not to get like sidetracked, but there is like just something to be said for, um, so some some things are just so ridiculous on their face. You know what I mean? Um, and like, yes, no, I don't have the surveys. I don't have the empirical research <laughs> to back that up. But at the same time, I just don't need it. Right. <laughs> it's like I just some things really are like that. And like and, and if somebody disagrees with that, I don't know what else to say. I just feel like we're at sort of a fundamental impasse at that point. 
I don't know. I just felt like I had to get that out. You don't have to respond yeah, to it if you don't. I, well, want, right? Yeah, just um, I mean, with regard to the survey question, I, I agree it would be nice. It would be really nice to actually do some experimental philosophy in this respect. But I, I guess my response in that Q&A was just to point out that um, it's a little we've got a little bit of a double standard going on here because when people do ethics or epistemology or metaphysics and then claim, you know, present something for our consideration and claim that it's pretty clear or pretty obvious. We don't, in those cases, demand that they do a survey or a poll. We just reflect on it and ask, you know, do I find this plausible? Seems pretty obvious, right? Yeah, and ordinarily we think that's enough. Sure, it might be nice to do some experimental philosophy and get some corroboration in that regard, but it's not required. Okay, so that's all. That's all I said. Great. Um, but anyway, yeah. So these two tests, the contradiction test, the test of contradiction, and the redundancy test, um, I don't think they're as good as the third test. The third test is um, what's called conjunction reduction. Mm -hmm. Conjunction reduction. So here's an example. Um, consider this sentence. The colors are light. Um, and then here's another sentence. The feathers are light. The colors are light. The feathers are light. So it seems like we're using the word light in two different senses. When we describe colors, we mean like pale or not saturated or whatever, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how to say it in another way. But when we're talking about feathers, we mean like not very much weight, mm -hmm. not much mass, you know? Um, we're using light in two different ways. Mm -hmm. And you can bring out this ambiguity um, by uh, doing this conjunction reduction test. So conjoining the sentences and eliminating one instance of the word light. So the sentence would be something like this. Um, the colors and the feathers are light. The colors are light, the feathers are light. Can you conjoin those and eliminate one instance of the word light and say the colors and the feathers are light? Mm -hmm. So that's supposed to strike you as like infelicitous, mm -hmm. as um, people working in this area say, or zoigmatic. It's supposed to not sound right. Um, and the reason is like, when you think about the colors that forces one interpretation of light. Yeah. But when you think about feathers that forces another interpretation, but the word lights only appearing once. And so right. we're not sure like, how am I supposed to read that word? You know, <laughs> um, we can kind of figure out what the person probably meant, but we would rephrase it so that the word light showed up two times. Um, or maybe the word light didn't show up at all. But anyway, that's supposed to sound kind of weird. The colors and the feathers are light. Um, here's another one. Um, here's a sentence. I saw her duck. I saw her swallow. So swallow could again be a verb or it could be that animal. Mm -hmm. Um, now what if we conjoin those and said something like, I saw her duck and swallow. Mm -hmm. I saw her duck and swallow. I saw her duck and swallow. So here's what, um, somebody has said about that kind of test. Um, he said that the first two sentences, I saw her duck and I saw her swallow are each open to two readings. Um, one where we're talking about an activity, a verb, um, and another one where we're talking about a noun, like mm -hmm. a waterfowl and a bird. Okay, um, but when you conjoin them in this way, I saw her duck and swallow, um, you have to read it so that either both of those phrases are verbs or we're, or both of them were using the nominal right. sense. Mm -hmm. it, it, you sort of rule out the one where the reading where they're mismatched. Yep. It sounds it sounds weird to try to get the mismatch reading. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's why this is relevant. That's the conjunction reduction test. And here's why that's relevant. Um, we can consider um, a sentence like this. So um, let's just, I just use an example of a, a rooster. And we can call the rooster gene. Um, and so what's interesting about birds is they do have um, genetically determined sex. They do have sex chromosomes, but their chromosomes are different from ours. Um, they don't use the same kind of sex chromosome system that we use in order to produce roosters that have the function of making sperm and hens that have the function of making eggs. Um, they do it a different way genetically. Sure. Okay. Um, but we can consider a rooster and um, we can name him Gene. Mm -hmm. And so I just told you about the kind of genetics that determine sex in chickens. Mm -hmm. um, now consider this sentence, gene is male. Gene is male. Okay, hold that sentence in your mind. Now consider crocodiles. Um, and let's name one crocodile. I chose Envo, which isn't really a name. Interesting. How about Lyle? 
What's that? Lyle the crocodile, of course. Yeah, that would have that would have been nice. But I, what I want to bring out is the fact that um, this guy's sex was determined by the environment. Oh, I see. So yes. I chose I chose Gene for the chicken because his sex is being determined genetically. Um, Envo is having his sex determined by the environment. Um, his uh, his when he was in an egg, it was incubated at a warmer temperature. I think it's like thirty five degrees Celsius yeah. or something. It's based on my research, <laughs> like something a of a scientist yeah. myself, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so his egg, when he was an egg, was incubated at a warm temperature. Okay. And he's got all the sort of anatomy typical of male crocodiles. He's producing sperm and so on. We're calling him Envo. Yep. Okay. Now um, we can conjoin these two sentences. Gene is male. Envo is male. We can conjoin them to say Gene and Envo are male. Mm -hmm. Gene and Envo are male. On the hypothesis that male is univocal, this should be just fine. There should be nothing weird or infelicitous about this sentence. Gene and Envo are male. On the ambiguity hypothesis, um, the background information that I gave you should force that kind of infelicitous reading mm -hmm. um, because I told you all about the rooster's genetics. So you should be getting a genetic reading of that, a chromosomal reading of that sentence, Gene is male. Mm -hmm. You should be hearing it as, oh, he's chromosomally male, chromosomally mm -hmm. male. That can't be the case with the Envo is male sentence because he doesn't have sex chromosomes. Yeah. Um, something else is making him male. Uh, mm -hmm. The environment, the temperature at which his egg was incubated. So you, there must be, on the ambiguity hypothesis, some other sense of the word male in that sentence. Mm -hmm. And so when we conjoin them, it should sound weird to us the way that the colors and the feathers are light sounds weird. Um, yeah, I'm, I was trying to think of how to do this with the word mouse, which is ambiguous. Um, like if I had an actual animal mouse and then I've got this computer mouse, um, I could say this is a mouse, this is a mouse. But then saying like I have two mice sounds mm. a little weird because mm -hmm. obviously I was using mouse in different senses. Right. Um, yeah, so that should the same thing should happen with male in the case of Gene and Envo. When I try mm -hmm. to say Gene and Envo are both male, if the word male is really ambiguous, that should strike us as infelicitous, zoigmatic. Right. But does it? Weird, but does it? <laughs> and let again, me run just, the test. Yeah, let me run. I'll just be, I'm doing a very, it's a small sample size. Um, <laughs> it's me and I guess you. Right. Um, yeah. We Good. can run a quick little test. And I'll just tell you, if I were a subject in the study, I would vote no problem with that sentence. That sounds just fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And just to make it even worse, we can like, pile the contextual information back into the sentence. Um, so to really force the zoigmatic reading on the on the ambiguity hypothesis, this should be infelicitous. We can say, we can think about this sentence. Gene, who has the sex chromosomes typical of roosters, and Envo, who has no sex chromosomes at all, are male. Mm. Let's consider that sentence. So again, I don't think there's any problem with that sentence. Yeah, they're both right. male. I get it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're into the ambiguity hypothesis, you should say, hold up, something, something weird is going on here. Mm -hmm. um, that's That sentence is poorly constructed. Something weird is going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was the third test. And as far as ambiguity tests go, I think that third one is probably the best. Yeah. Uh -huh. Again, I don't, I don't present any of these as like conclusive. Like, hey, we've got a knockdown argument here. Because it turns out um, language is really messy and weird and complicated and hard mm -hmm. to pin down. And I get that. Um, I'm just presenting you some standard ambiguity tests and saying, from my perspective at least, it looks like uh, these words male and female fail the ambiguity tests. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're not we're not finding ambiguity here. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was like one more, but I guess I'll just stop and see if you wanted to say anything real quick. No, I mean, this is, this is, this has been great. Uh, you're great at, I guess you already presented this. So you have a little bit of rehearsal, but you're doing a fantastic job tracking everything so far. Uh, I imagine yeah. the listeners are as well. Um, and that's right. That, that, that all seems right to me. Those results seem right. I, I would imagine again, if you, if you, if you did run the surveys and you um, had people to sort of honestly report that uh it would probably favor your hypothesis right uh i don't What's have it? that I, I don't have that uh, uh, available so i can't prove that uh but just yeah. strikes me as probably the case 
Um, we can at least say this. It's some evidence against the ambiguity hypothesis. Let's yeah, say yeah, <laughs> it yeah. Some evidence. It's not what you would expect um, on the ambiguity hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last now, one. Oh, yeah, sorry. no, you, f you finish everything you want to get through, and then I'll uh, throw some more general questions at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the last test um, is what um, philosopher UC Davis, Adam Sennett, um, calls an Aristotelian test. He attributes it to Aristotle. Um, and he says that um, Aristotle offers this test. You should try to construct a definition that encompasses both meanings, or in our case, like all the alleged meanings, um, and posit ambiguity only if you fail. So try for uh, univocity. Try to come up with a univocal sense that would explain all the data. And posit ambiguity only if you fail. Um, and he gives the example of like uncle, like what if somebody was under the impression that the word uncle is ambiguous and they think, well, one sense is when it's like a brother of your father. Another sense is when it's a brother of your mother. And those are mm -hmm. two different senses of uncle. Um, and you run the ambiguity test by them and they claim that, um, yeah, it passes all the ambiguity tests. Well, I guess the idea of this fourth test is try to come up with a definition that encompasses both and then posit ambiguity only if you fail. Mm -hmm. And of course, the definition that encompasses both is brother of a parent. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all you, That's all it takes to be an uncle <clears throat> is to be the brother of a parent. Mm -hmm. Then you're an uncle. Um, and so I guess, I mean, it's not super clear to me how this test works, but I guess what we're appealing to is just a kind of parsimony or sure. simplicity. like. Mm -hmm. I can explain all the data and I'm only positing one sense. You to explain the data claim that there's all this ambiguity going on and that's a more complicated hypothesis, I guess. So I guess we're really just appealing to kind of principle of parsimony. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the application in our case here is, it looks like we can do something like this when it comes to um, male and female. And you can see that by just, um, considering what people mean when they tell you about these alleged other senses of male and female, when they say, well, there's this chromosomal sense of male. Mm -hmm. It's possible to be chromosomally male. When you ask them what that means, sometimes they'll just say this, uh, XY chromosomes. That's what it is to be chromosomally male. But if you press them and say like, well, why is it XY? Why isn't it XX, right? <laughs> the answer is, well, you know, in and also, you know, other species have males that don't have XY chromosomes at all. So um, we could ask that. Like, why did you choose XY? Mm -hmm. And it's because, I guess, in humans, that's the chromosomal structure that is typical of males. Right? And we kind of already <laughs> knew that. That's how we could point to that chromosomal structure and say, this one deserves to be called chromosomally male. Mm -hmm. It's because we already knew who the males were. Yeah, And we mm -hmm. saw a pattern of chromosomal structure in them. If we really had no idea <clears throat> who chromosomal males and females were, we just saw some humans tend to have XY chromosomes, some have XX. Why would we call one male and the other female, right? Like, right, yeah, there's there's yeah. a presupposition there that really exactly. cannot be ignored, yeah, right? We're, yeah, we're presupposing a sense of the word male. Yep. Same thing with um, hormonally male and hormonally female. When you ask what is it to be hormonally male, they'll say high levels of testosterone, low levels of estrogen, or something like that. Yeah. And when you say, "Well, why did you pick that um, arrange or that those levels of hormones?" Again, the answer has to be because like those are the hormone levels typical of males. Man, so, um, males. so so you so what, heard, is, what does the word mean there? Right? Yeah, <laughs> so we've heard of the transcendental argument for God. Tag. This is the T A A G, the transcendental argument against gender theory. T A A. Okay. Something like that. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, that sounds sounds like some good clickbait. You should just title. <laughs> there, there's our clip. Movie. There's our highlight <laughs> clip right there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But the point is, there is this presupposition, right? That, yeah. that we really and, just can't yeah. act like that's not there, right? Uh -huh. And so if we just got clear on what that fundamental sense of the word male is, and what mm -hmm. that fundamental sense of the word female is, then um, as in the uncle case, we'd be able to explain all these other things that we're saying. Mm -hmm. When we say hormonally male, we're not using male in another sense. We're, we're just talking about an organism that has hormone levels typical of males of that species. Right. That's all we're saying. And that's it. Um, yeah. And then when we say that other organisms have 
chromosomal structure is typical of males of that species. We're talking about the same groups. Mm -hmm. The ones who had typical hormone levels and the ones who had typical chromosomal structures, it's the same group. They're the males mm -hmm. in both cases. Okay, and then I, I think the next, the final step is just to reflect on what that fundamental sense could be. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? And I guess, you know, I didn't, I didn't bury the lead. I kind of said that up front, but I think mm -hmm. the way you can prove that to be male is to um, be an organism that has the function of producing sperm right. and to be female is to be an organism that has the function of producing ova. Mm -hmm. The way you can prove that is just uh, reflect on other species um, and reflect on the fact that this phenomenon that we're interested in of sexual reproduction has been going on for a, a super long time. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, before there were trees. Um, it's older than a whole lot of things that are very old. It's been happening for a super long time. And it goes on in very primitive organisms. Mm -hmm. My understanding is like the placozoa is the most primitive of all animals. It's just a couple thousand cells. Hmm. Um, but my understanding is there are males and females. Wow. Female and female placozoa. I think it's the most primitive animal that reproduces sexually. And so when you figure out, well, what do, what do biologists mean when they describe a placozoa as male and a placozoa as female? What they mean is, oh, well, these critters are producing sperm and these are producing eggs. Um, so it's defined in terms of the kinds of um, sex cells that are being produced, the kinds of gametes that are being produced. And in the paper, I provide a couple of quotations from biologists saying as much. So, I mean, when biologists actually reflect on this, they say the same thing. Um, I've got a quotation here from Jesse Latonin and Jeff Parker from 2014 who say, these are biologists, not philosophers, mm -hmm. um, who say that males are those individuals that produce smaller gametes, for example, sperm, while females are defined as those that produce the larger gametes. Of course, in many species, a whole suite of secondary sex characteristics exists, but the fundamental definition is rooted in this definition of gametes. Okay. So again, just because two biologists said it doesn't mean it's true, but um, that's some evidence that that's what biologists are talking about. But I think that the better evidence is just reflect on the way biologists are using this word and what 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 properties they seem to be tracking and notice that they use the words to describe very, very simple organisms, organisms that just share nothing with us with regard to hormone levels, chromosome structure, primary and secondary sex characteristics. Um, they just share nothing with us in those regards no gender identity, no gender roles, mm -hmm. nothing like that. The only thing we have in common that could make us both males or make us both females in that case would be the kind of gametes that are produced. The reproductive role, right? Yeah. Um, but again, just want a quick add when, even when biologists say things like males produce sperm, females produce eggs, I think they're using that sort of present tense construction in the same way that they do when they say hearts pump blood the CCR5 receptor binds chemokines. Right. They're using this like present tense construction. Um, and what they just mean is like when functioning properly. Right, yeah. When it's doing what it's supposed to do, when it's functioning mm -hmm. properly. Hearts pump blood. Mm -hmm. Of course, a diseased heart may not do that. Um, but nevertheless, that type of organ has the function of, of pumping blood. Okay, same thing with males. Although some males due to age or injury or disease may not produce sperm, and some females due to age or injury or disease may not produce ova. Nevertheless, they have the function um, of producing sperm or producing ova. And that's what makes them male or female. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much uh, the paper. There was one other like minor concern that was brought to my attention recently I could just tell you about. Since yeah, sure. We're on the subject. Um, so some people worry about, um, in the case of some species, uh, females undergo menopause, which seems like a kind of programming that the organism has to actually shut down egg production. Um, uh, and I guess I should have looked into this before we talked, because I've been meaning to look into like what actually happens during menopause and are do the eggs degenerate or are they just no longer produced or do you actually run out of eggs? Um, because my understanding is like at least human females are born with all the eggs they'll ever have. Is that right? I, I have heard that. They um, generate it in utero and then the eggs are generated in utero and then released during the course mm -hmm. of a lifetime. And I guess I'd be super surprised if um, 
the eggs literally the, the egg supply is depleted in menopause gosh i shouldn't just be speculating we should actually look into this um but just as a matter of fact no more um ovulation Let's yeah say that. Mm -hmm. no more ovulation and so some people raise this as an objection to the view that to be female is to have the function of producing ova because they'll say what about postmenopausal females um, who no longer have that function and i guess what's what's sort of plausible about the idea that the the very function is lost is the fact that this seems to be a kind of it was it, it evolved um it's it's sort of a programming it's not a fluke or an accident um the female body is programmed to do this mm -hmm. um to sort of shut down ovulation and so it, it's kind of tempting to say post post menopause um uh these humans um i mean we don't want to beg the question and say females are women um but these people um, no longer have the function of producing ova. Okay, so that's the objection. And then I guess um, here's this is maybe I shouldn't have shared this on YouTube to be recorded forever, because <laughs> this is all just kind of like on the record I'm, now, right? Yeah, stuff that I'm thinking about these days. Um, but I wonder. I mean, what I'm what I need to look into to like finish this paper is um, might this be a case of um, what's called like masking. When a when a disposition, or you, I think you could even describe a function as being masked, like how um, you know a wine glass is disposed to break. You know, it's mm -hmm. so fragile that it's disposed to break. Mm -hmm. But if you wrap it in bubble wrap, um, then you've masked the disposition, mm -hmm. um, so that if you drop it, it's not going to break anymore, right? But mm -hmm. um, it, what what seems right is to say it still is disposed to break. You've just made it so that this disposition won't be triggered. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you could do the same thing like with a car. You could mask its disposition to start by, I don't know, blocking the ignition switch or something like that. It still yeah. has that function and it's even disposed to do it. You've just made it difficult to like trigger the disposition. Yeah. Okay. So um, something like that happens in real life with um, my understanding is <laughs> as a philosopher, not a biologist, but I'm pretty sure that female worker bees um, have all the machinery required to produce eggs and ovulate. Mm -hmm. um, but this disposition, this function is being masked by pheromones that are reduced, that are produced by the, um, by the queen. Okay. So the queen like re releases these pheromones and shuts down egg production in the worker bees so that the queen is the only one that can produce eggs. Okay, um, but I think it's still true to say that these are female worker bees, even though like they're kind of undergoing, I was going to say artificial menopause, but it's not really artificial. Like that's the way bees are supposed to, that's how bees roll. <laughs> that's what they right. do. Yeah. Um, so it's not really artificial, it's natural. Um, and it is a kind of menopause. It's a sort of like shunting or masking of egg production. Um. So maybe that's the thing to say of human menopause. Um, there's this, it's not an external mechanism from like a queen bee. It's an internal mechanism. This little bit of programming has evolved and propagated in the population that masks the disposition to produce ova or that um, yeah, masks that function. But it's still there. The function's still there. The disposition's yeah. still there. It's just being masked. Um, so if that's true, then that would be a good response to this objection. Well, what, yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand the objection as, as, as best I can, because what's the issue of just saying that the function is time bound, that function would still. Well, yeah, if you wanted to define female as having this function, and then we have these humans who don't have the function, then you'd have to say, oh, well, then I guess it would follow that they're not female. And if you think women are adult human females, then it would follow that these aren't women anymore. And I'm told, um, Alex Byrne pointed out to me that I think that was actually Simone de Beauvoir's view okay. that postmenopausal um, women are not female anymore. Postmenopausal women, she would say, are not female anymore. Um, so, it, but then, I mean, you can't really say that women are adult human females in that case. Just really right. Like yeah. So quickly, okay. So that's, that's, that's interesting. Because uh, yeah. So earlier we, really we talked. I'm yeah, considering yeah. like other people's views. I haven't mm -hmm. endorsed my own view here. So just when I say like, then you couldn't really say that women are adult human females. 
there was a big old antecedent there. Like, if you accept this and this and this, then it would follow that women are an adult human females. Yeah. So that's the problem. Um, if you want to defend the view that women are adult human females and to be female is to have the function of producing ova, um, you, yeah, you got to say something about humans who apparently have lost that function and yet we can't, they, we still want to say are female yeah. and are women. Yeah. yeah. So earlier we talked about function versus disposition. You know, I'm inclined toward an Aristotelian picture of things a lot of times. And um, I guess my initial speculation here, and let me emphasize that that's all it is because uh, I don't spend nearly as much time in these weeds as you do, is that that person is still the type of thing that had that disposition yeah. at a particular time. Um, um, and I don't see them substantially changing if that if the expression of that disposition is time bound, if that makes sense for, for various reasons. Yeah. Um, well, um, maybe that's, you, maybe that's, do wrong, you still yeah. want to say that like to be female is to have a disposition to produce over. Because if that's true, then the fact that this person had the disposition, but lost it, then it would follow that they're no longer female. Mm, yeah. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. You could say, mm -hmm. well, maybe here's, you know, upon reflection, maybe here's what biologists have struck upon. Um, to be female is actually to just have had the disposition <laughs> or like you will have it or you do have it at some point in the creature's life, this disposition will naturally manifest. Like yeah. That. So uh, I guess I got to think about the definition a little bit more. Right. So earlier I said, the disposition to play a particular reproductive role, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just thinking aloud right now, right? That uh, does that do. role, right? Does that role have to be actively played yeah. um, at all times to yeah. put somebody under that classification? I guess is just the direction I'm thinking. Yeah, let me just about give you one, right, right. one more uh -huh. example. Um, this, mm -hmm. I mean, here's something else to think about as you think through mm -hmm. the prospects of a definition that says something like to be male is just to have had or have or will have the function of producing sperm. Like at some time in the organism's lifetime, this function is naturally there. Mm -hmm. um, here's one complication. Uh, there are sequential hermaphrodites in nature, uh, like clownfish. Um, and some other species of fish mm -hmm. can, depending on the environment, like actually switch what kind of gametes they're producing. And my understanding is like, it's because the internal mechanisms required for the gamete production are pretty similar and right. the gametes themselves are pretty similar. So that's why these organisms can do it. Um, it's pretty easy for them. Okay. Um, but if you said that to be a male is just to have had at some point in the organism's lifespan, the function of producing male. Then you have to say of a stage in which this clownfish is only producing ova, right? Like wired to produce ova, you'd have to say mm -hmm. still male, mm -hmm. like male and female. So mm -hmm. not actually a sequential hermaphrodite, actually mm -hmm. a simultaneous hermaphrodite for the whole lifespan. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's not like a devastating objection. You could just kind of take that on board and say, yeah, you know, this is kind get of get clowned like, by the clownfish, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, now you can just, I mean, sometimes like a good theory will cause us to revise our evaluation of borderline cases or edge cases, you know, and mm -hmm. this is kind of an edge case. Um, it's a little bit unusual. So it's not, it, it's not a huge revision of our worldview to say clownfish aren't sequential hermaphrodites. They're actually simultaneous hermaphrodites. Um, it's not the end of the world to say that, but that isn't what biology textbooks say. Just FYI. <laughs> They right, say sequential. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, to be honest, I don't know. I, I'm not, I, it wouldn't be the end of the world to me to have to accept that uh, clownfish. Are, <laughs> it doesn't all hinge on the clownfish. Yeah, is what you're yeah. That, I mean, that seems, that seems definitely plausible to me. Right. Um, and look, I, uh, I'm not a scientist myself, so I don't know how many examples are out there like the clownfish. Um, uh, and again, I'm just, I'm just sort of, I like, I like the original uh, response you gave too. That certainly seems plausible to me as well, but uh, here we are just kind of. Yeah. The, the masking one. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But that would actually require, and this is something that's been on my to-do list for a while, like mm -hmm. checking out what like the actual, 
what's happening at a um, biological level during menopause um, are is yeah is the capacity to produce eggs just being like irrevocably destroyed so that it, it's not like wrapping a wine glass in bubble wrap it's more just like smashing the wine glass or something like that yeah and then it's not disposed to break anymore you know because it's already broken right um uh -huh. yeah so that's something to think about yeah some so a future research project but let me make clear for the audience this is this is a bit separate uh from what we talked about before because before we were asking if there's ambiguity here and now we're actually trying to get an appropriate definition yeah, right and right. uh the one of the other things that um uh, I, you're engaged in is um, I know you you referenced uh, Alex Byrne and stuff like that, and uh, I guess you're trying to um, uh, you know present the the more Aristotelian understanding of things. Is is that fair to say? Would you would you accept the uh, that yeah, that, I mean, that label? Um, I don't know how happy true like Aristotelians like hardcore Aristotelians would be, but there is function talk involved. And there is, you know, talk of like final ends or goals or purposes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I don't know. I I'm going to try to refrain from using words like forms and stuff and like substantial forms. Um, <laughs> sure, okay. Just because that would really, that would really perturb a lot of people. Whereas I think function talk is pretty safe, even in like contemporary biology. Contemporary biology is just full of function talk. Oh, it's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, of course, like if you press them, they're not going to say like, yeah, I'm committed to full-blown Aristotelianism and I believe in substantial mm -hmm. forms. Um, but nevertheless, and final like causality and right. Yeah, all it's, that, yeah. it's super, um, super appealing or attractive to describe the biological world in terms of functions. Um, it's hard not to, especially in the realm of like human biology and medicine. I mean, I mean medicine. Yeah. yeah it demands the, it, the, right? the very idea of medicine is like something that helps right? mm -hmm. something that produces health and so those those that concept of health is a sort of teleological function or sorry yeah. teleological concept mm -hmm. um, you've got to think that like the human organism has a kind of optimal yeah way of being otherwise medicine can't be like healing it's just altering right yeah, and that's altering. definitely not how we think about it uh-huh yeah yeah Good. Well, uh, yeah, I don't, we don't have to keep here speculate on this. That's cool. I'll, I'll be excited to follow up with you and, and see how you kind of round this, this one out. Is there anything else you want to say about this paper or the project in general? Any sort of final summary thoughts on it? Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Really helpful. And i uh, glad you're doing this work. It's, it's, it's important work. Uh, I know that uh, it's not the easiest work to do for various reasons. So that's uh, appreciated. Uh, always always insightful uh especially for somebody well, it's like fun me. to do things that are relevant in philosophy you know like <laughs> there's a lot, right. of, a lot of philosophical topics where it's hard to see any connection to ordinary life um but yeah this 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 sort of topic is not like that right yeah hey so um you got another meeting coming up right so you probably you split here um i have i have some time do you want to talk about something else let's talk about epistemology if you're cool with it or, or you pick epistemology or your um naturalist uh science paper i forget the title of it um so do i was it what's if, if naturalism is true then scientific, scientific explanation, explanation is impossible, is impossible. That's right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> had a good bold title right yeah yeah um you know to be honest i haven't really thought about that in a while um let's do epistemology just, then mm -hmm. yeah I, I just talked with someone about it um mm -hmm. here in my office but so you but, had yeah, it's not really top of mind but the epistemology stuff's top of mind you know? yeah so let's do it you've um you've solved the fundamental problem in epistemology it finally <laughs> happened um and that was uh, exciting news yeah it, it turned on you know the mainstream media and Breaking yeah. news. Thomas Bogardus finally did it. Um, solved, yeah. <laughs> it's done, right? Uh, actually, I think your theory is really cool. And I was yeah. really intrigued by it. And uh, and uh, I'm, I just want to kind of ask you, like, where it is right now. So for people who don't remember, we did have a conversation about it a while ago, maybe maybe even two years ago or something like that. Yeah. Um, give us a, a rundown of, of what your theory is, your original paper, and then maybe we could talk about some of the recent developments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Well, I guess we could think about just a real quick Gettier case. Um, so a Gettier case was meant to show that having a true belief that you have good reason to hold 
-hmm. isn't enough for knowledge. Um, it's not sufficient. And um, here's kind of a classic Gettier style case. You're driving along the countryside, not at super high speed, so you can kind of see what's happening. Um, and you see something that looks just exactly like a sheep. Um, and that really is how it appears. It appears just like a sheep. And so you form the belief, oh, there's a sheep in that field. Mm -hmm. um, unbeknownst to you, um, that is not a sheep. It's just a very shaggy dog mm -hmm. that looks just like a sheep. So it's not really your fault that you believed it was a sheep. You know, you had all the evidence typical of when you see a sheep, you know. Okay. Um, so it looks like you, you didn't really know there was a sheep in that field because it was actually just a dog. Mm -hmm. So that's like one stroke of bad luck that happens in Gideon cases. Yep. You had good but misleading evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then to make it a Gettier case, we kind of rescue you with a second stroke of luck, but it's good luck this time. And we make your belief true nonetheless. Um, so you had good but misleading evidence. It kind of looks like your belief's going to be false, but then we rescue it by making the belief true. So in this case, we could put a real sheep in the field just kind of behind a rock. So you didn't see it, but there there is a sheep in that field. Mm -hmm. And that's what you believe. You believe there's a sheep in the field. Okay, so you've got a true belief because mm -hmm. there is a sheep in the field and it looks like you had justification. I mean, it's the kind of justification that would have been good enough had it been a real sheep. Yeah. Um, like you saw something that looks just like a sheep. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Gettier said, it's pretty clear that this isn't knowledge. Mm -hmm. And did he ever do a survey? <laughs> no, but other people have. They Thank have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, philosophers didn't know what to think until we, right, yeah, until yeah. we got the survey. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, and another one is just looking at a, a stopped clock. You know, a stopped clock is right twice a day, but um, suppose it's a reliable clock. It's in your office. You've used it many times before. You have every reason to trust it. Mm -hmm. But bad luck, the batteries just died. Um, or I guess actually they just died. They died last night. So like right now it's about 125. Um, but suppose the clock stopped at 125 this morning. Mm -hmm. But I happen to look at it at just the right time. Okay. So that's the kind of evidence that would have been good enough in a in a normal case where it really is 125 p.m. and my clock is working. Um, but since it was stopped, uh, this is kind of it's not actually a good method of learning the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. Okay. So it looks like this isn't going to be knowledge, but we rescued it by saying it really is 125. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it really is 125. That's like putting the sheep in the field behind yep. the rock. Okay. So um, philosophers have been thinking about these sorts of cases for a long time and trying to figure out, well, what's missing? You know, what, what do we need for knowledge? After all, knowledge is very valuable. We want as much as we can get. Um, this is important stuff. We should figure out what knowledge is. So mm -hmm. Among other things, we could try to figure out what's wrong with conspiracy theories, what's wrong with fake news, what's wrong with echo chambers. Mm -hmm. Those are all the cool applied topics in yeah, yeah, in, a, in epistemology. Right. What's wrong, mm -hmm. with, what's wrong with gaslighting? Okay, so we're trying to figure <laughs> out what knowledge is, um, and so I and a former student of mine wrote a paper together, mm -hmm. saying, "Well, maybe here's what's going on in these cases. Um, the problem is that you you do have a true belief, which is good." Um, but the belief that you hold um, isn't explained by the truth of your belief. You don't mm -hmm. hold it because it's true. Right. You don't believe it because it's yeah. true. Right. Yeah, you don't you don't believe this because it's true. You don't believe that there's a sheep in the field because there's a sheep in the field. You believe there's a sheep in the field because there's a shaggy dog in the field that looks just like a sheep. Mm -hmm. And so although your belief turned out to be true, it didn't have the right sort of explanatory connection to the truth. Mm -hmm. It was just a coincidence that it turned out to be true. Right. Same thing in the stopped clock case. Um, although I believe it's 125 p.m. because that's what my clock says up on the mm -hmm. wall. Um, I don't, the, the clock doesn't say that, If assuming it's stopped. It doesn't say that it's 125 p.m. because it really is 125 p.m. Rather, the clock reads 125 because it was 125 when the clock stopped. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'm not believing that it's 125 because it is 125. I'm believing that it's 125 because it was, mm -hmm. um, at, you know, earlier this morning. Okay, um, so it looks like the case, the the view nicely handles Gettier cases, which is mm -hmm. cool. Something else that can be said in its favor is um, when we try to debunk each other's beliefs, 
it looks like what we try to do is attack this very condition on knowledge. We try to show that you don't believe that because it's true. Yeah, we right. say something like, well, you you only believe in God because... Grandma. Who, yeah, who your grandma was, who your parents were, because you're scared of death or mm -hmm. whatever. You, you've got daddy issues. Mm -hmm. um, and all those kind of debunking explanations try to show how it's like a Gettier case. Like, yeah. Even if God existed, you wouldn't know that God existed because you're believing for these other reasons. Mm -hmm. Even if there's a sheep in the field, you wouldn't know it because you're just seeing the shaggy dog. Mm -hmm. Even if God existed, you're just believing whatever your parents told you or you're just a victim of wish fulfillment or mm -hmm. you're a victim of unjust social economic structures and you're mm -hmm. imbibing the opium of the masses or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So that's how debunking arguments tend to work. You just believe that because, and then we try to like sever the connection between your belief and the truth and truth. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's suggestive. <laughs> that's, Strongly. So it, yeah. What it suggests is, Oh, well, I guess then if I had been believing this because it's true, I, I, I would count as knowing it. Mm -hmm. So knowledge is just believing something because it's true. Okay. Um, so maybe I guess with our remaining time, you want to just hear like a counter example real quick? Yeah. And I just do want to emphasize people should go back and listen to our original conversation on this. Cause I think we focused it in the religious context. If I remember right, it's been a while since we had that, right? Yeah. Uh, which was, which was cool. It was show how you can, um, kind of get out from underneath of the weight of those debunking objections with this. Yeah, I think the reason I first started thinking about this was um, I was thinking about that elsewhere, else when objection to religious belief. Like, right. had you been born at a different time in a different place, you would have had different religious beliefs. Um, so that has the structure, this typical structure of debunking arguments. And what it's trying to show is mm -hmm. you don't hold your belief because it's true. Um, you hold it for other reasons, you know, social reasons because of early childhood teaching and socialization. Um, when I wrote that paper back in 2013, um, I didn't have this theory of knowledge in mind. I didn't really have any theory of knowledge in mind. I just tried to respond to that argument and show why it's no good. But now I think I have a clear understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So I think the response in the religious case is to try to show that although I may have been influenced by my parents and my culture, and you know, wanting to fit in with a certain friend group, sure, yeah, I admit it. I'm we're all biased in various ways. Yeah. Also, hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm believing for good reasons. Um, you know, like argument and evidence that's actually connected to the truth. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's not so it, it's not so implausible that if somebody really just did hold a religious belief because their parents told them, they that may not count as knowledge. I guess it depends on why their parents told them that if their parents told them that just as a joke <laughs> or just to mess with the kid or, I mean, some parents say, I want to raise my kids religious just so they get some morals or something like that. They don't really right. think the religion is true. Mm -hmm. They just like the community. Mm -hmm. So I think in that case, yeah, maybe knowledge has not been preserved in this kind of testimony, but yeah. in other cases, hopefully in my case, um, I did get connected to the truth in the right sort of way to count for my belief to count as knowledge. Mm -hmm. So let me just I'll share one alleged counterexample. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. um, this one's actually from a friend of mine named Andrew Moon, philosopher Andrew Moon. That's right. Yes, this, I remember his paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, he and Kenneth Boyce, philosopher Kenneth Boyce, um, they defend a kind of proper functionalism view about what knowledge is. Mm -hmm. And they just gave, uh, they were kind enough in philosophy. This is like a gift. Um, they were kind enough to offer me what they think is a devastating objection to my view. <laughs> Some friends. <laughs> yeah. That's um, right. I, yeah. I remember they, they, in grad school, um, one of my professors said, like, you know, we were reading an essay written by someone else in the department. And then we were just, you know, thinking of objections and trying to cause problems for it. And then somebody in the class was like, should we really be doing this? You know, like this is a professor in our department. And the professor who was reading the class was like, um, you know, the best you can hope for in philosophy is that people talk about your views. Um, what's worse is if they're not talking about your views. You know? Yeah. And if they talk about your views, they're probably going to be objecting to it. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty rare for somebody to bring up your view just to say how cool it is. That doesn't, um, get, usually, that doesn't get published. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, high fives are not published. Um, right. You got to have some sort of criticism. So anyway, um, thought it was nice of Andrew to do that. Um, but and, and yeah, so for people who don't know, proper functionalism, that's coming down from the Plantingian sort of world, yeah, right? right? So, um, yeah. and you were, you are not in that camp. You made that that clear last time. So we got we got yeah. warring we got warring factions here. <laughs> Lots of heat, but still, we're friends. We're all friends. So yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to pull up the case. I'll just read it verbatim. Sure. So they call this um, holo projector, like a hologram, a holo mm -hmm. projector. And uh, they, they call this person Misha, I think. I think that's how you would say the name. M-I-C-H-A. Okay, Misha. Misha sees what appears to be a vase sitting on a pedestal. As it happens, the pedestal is really a holographic projector. And there is no vase on top of it. Rather, what Misha is seeing is merely a realistic holographic projection. Misha, who is ignorant of these facts, comes to believe there is a vase in front of him. Okay, are we okay so far? We got this little like box mm -hmm, projector mm -hmm. and it's... Oh yeah, these this, yeah, the proposed counterexamples in epistemology can get uh, complicated in a really interesting way. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But I guess um, this this kind of thing exists. I was actually in the Atlanta airport recently, I think, and they had this like really thing that was spinning really fast, and I think it had little LEDs on it, so that by spinning really fast, it could make something like a screen, and by changing the pattern of the LED lights, it could make an image. Oh, what cool. was really weird is the image appeared to be three D and spinning. Wow! <laughs> and it was a gun, <laughs> 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 and it was trying to tell us no guns. Um, but it was really, it was just bizarre. It was just like connected to the ceiling and it was just like the future is here. Three dimensional Crazy. image of a gun, but then like a red circle with an X through it would come up and it'd be like, no guns. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, no guns. Good. Um, <laughs> it wasn't like, get your guns here. Um, yeah. but anyway, it was like, it was like a holographic projector kind of thing. And although yeah. it didn't look real, maybe one day we'll get to the point where somebody <laughs> might've actually mistaken that for a for floating, sure. a floating firearm. So anyway, we got something like that going on, um, but they, they add this twist. They say, um, as it turns out, hidden in a hollow compartment within the pedestal, out of sight, is a vase. The setup is such that the pedestal projects a realistic holographic image of whatever is in that compartment onto its surface. And this explains why Misha sees the image before him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in my Atlanta airport case, I guess like if that thing had actually been a projector and like there was a gun just above it and it was scanning that and then projecting the image and the image looks so realistic that I mistook it for a real gun, then I would have been in this sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is this an alleged counterexample? Um, they say that given the setup, the fact that Misha believes there's a vase in front of him is explained at least in part by the fact that there is a vase in front of him. So they think the explanation is going to go something like this. He believes there's a vase in front of him because it looks like there's a vase in front of him. And it looks that way because this projector is scanning an actual vase that's in front of him and then projecting it onto this pedestal. Mm -hmm. So this chain of explanation does mention the vase that is in front of Misha. And so he believes there's a vase in front of him. And that proposition shows up in the explanation of why he believes it. Um, but second half of the counter example, clearly, um, he doesn't really know that there's a vase in front of him. So they say like my view of knowledge explanationism entails that this guy knows that there's a vase in front of him, mm -hmm. but isn't it obvious that, um, there is no vase in front of him. Mm -hmm. And so in reply, of course, what I said was you haven't conducted any surveys. <laughs> <laughs> no, Where's the survey? Devastated. <laughs> Where's the survey, buddy? Um, buddies. Um, no, in reply, what I said really quick was, um, and then we'll just wrap it up with this. Um, what we said in the original paper was um, the truth of your belief, in order to know that a proposition is true, the truth of your belief has to figure crucially into the explanation of your belief, mm -hmm. has to figure crucially into the explanation of your belief. And what that means is we couldn't eliminate it and still explain why you believe as you do. So it's crucial. Like if you removed it from the explanation, you wouldn't have a good explanation anymore. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. we borrowed this idea from a philosopher of science who says something similar about scientific explanation. 
if you want to know whether something is a difference maker um, in a scientific explanation, if you want to know whether, like, I don't know, here, I've got this little clothespin for some reason. I've got a clothespin on my mm -hmm. on my finger here, and I'm, I'm feeling pain as a result, just a little mm -hmm. bit of pain. Um, if you If I wanted a scientific explanation of why, I guess, you know, it'd start in my brain and go back through my nerves, and then it would... I guess the scientific explanation would have to cite the spring mechanism here and the rigidity of the material that it's made out of. Um, those would all be difference makers in the explanation of why I'm feeling pain. But the color of this thing wouldn't figure into the explanation. Mm. It doesn't really matter what color the clothespin is. It's just wood, you know, natural right. wood colored. But if it were red, that wouldn't have really mattered. Mm -hmm. um, so although you might have said like, well, you're feeling pain because a natural wood colored clothespin is clamping on your pinky you don't really need to mention the color right um, <laughs> the, the explanation is just as good when you say you've got a clothespin clamped to your pinky that's why you know? you're right um so in order for um on the view of knowledge that i was presenting in order for your belief to count as knowledge the truth of the belief needs to figure crucially into the explanation in that way you can't delete it and still have an explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think that in the Misha case with the vase, mm -hmm. the fact that the compartment that the holo projector is scanning is in front of Misha doesn't really matter to the explanation. It's like the color of the clothespin. It doesn't really matter. Um, like had the had the um, compartment been off to the side and mm -hmm. you know it was scanning whatever's in that compartment over there and then projecting it over here. Um, we still would understand why Misha believes as he does. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that, all that to say, like the the location of the of the vase is just kind of incidental. It's not really crucial to the explanation. And so whew, fortunately, that means um, that the truth of Misha's belief doesn't actually figure into the You dodged a big one, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So the explanation of his belief is actually something like, well, he believes there's a vase in front of him because that's how things look. And things look that way because there is a projector that is scanning anything in, in its compartment. Right. And then projecting that onto the pedestal. I don't need to mention where the compartment is. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, and so the fact that there's a vase in that compartment and the compartment's in front of him, that won't figure crucially into the explanation. Okay, so yeah, that's that's what um, my co-author and I say in reply. The co-author is Will Perrin, who's a graduate student at Georgetown University now, um, awesome. former Pepperdine student. Um, but also in this paper, we respond to like, I think four other objections. But yeah, I'm not well, going to tell you about those now. No, that's okay. That's that's great. We'll give us something to look yeah. uh, forward to. I'm glad that your project is uh, continuing to be developed and stress tested. That's very good because, like I said, I. Um, I thought I had a lot going for it. I still do think it has a lot going for it. So that's that's awesome. So before we close this one out, uh, it's been it's been great. We covered a lot of territory. Uh, I mean, you mentioned everything you're kind of up to, but any like any things you want to plug <laughs> at all? The things you've already done, uh, work, uh, website, um, any of that, Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I guess I mean I usually just announce things on Twitter if people were interested in what I'm doing. Um, I try to use Twitter mostly for announcing. But sometimes I do argue with people. <laughs> um, so just follow me on Twitter. It's just my name. And you can see other sorts of interviews I've done on YouTube. If you just search for my name on YouTube, you'll find some other things. Um, if you search for my name using Google, um, you'll find my professional website, which has links to all my papers. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Bogardus, and thank you, gentle listeners, for tuning in. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. Please leave your thoughts in the comment section, and we'll see you guys in the next